Hi, this is Privateer Station, and today we're bringing you another work of remarkable investigative journalism. This stream aired on Yulia Latina's channel about a week ago, on the 27th of October, and she sits down with Krista Grozev, uh, one of the lead investigators with Bellingcat, an investigative journalism group based out of Netherlands that was founded by British journalist Elliot Higgins back in 2014. They specialize in uh, findings in both professional and citizen journalist investigations into war zones, human rights abuses, and the criminal underworld. Christo is the lead Russian investigator with Bellingcat. He is focusing on security threats, extraterritorial clandestine operations, and the weaponization of information. He investigated the downing of MH17 flight, poisoning of Navalny, and his investigations into the identity of the suspects involved in 2018 poisoning of Sergei and Yulia Skupal in Britain earned him and his team the European Press Prize for Investigative Journalism. This one is brought to you by one of our new volunteer voices. Enjoy. Christo, when did you start this investigation? What spurred you on? We started the investigation in early April. And partially, I can say it began after a conversation with you and after your broadcast, in which we discussed the ridiculously poor quality of the Russian system of satellite guidance called GLONASS, its poor reliability, and how easy it is to jam it, and how confusing the system is for the Russian troops, remember? Yes. And so we began to ask ourselves, if the Russian satellite guidance system is not predictable, then how can they operationalize the high-precision missiles that have one particular characteristic compared to all other types of missiles? They fly very low, at about 30 to 50 meters above ground which means that the operator needs to know the specific route the missile will take, all possible obstacles, including those that have appeared recently, because you cannot have the missile fly into some new building that was constructed a year ago. Therefore, because most likely the Russians do not have access to the latest maps, and in the absence of the reliable satellite guidance system, GLONASS, we realized that most likely they are working in the manual mode, creating simulations of each flight, which would require specific people to program each missile. We consulted with many experts on this topic. And they explained to us that it is, of course, possible to program the missiles manually, and most likely this is how it's done. But no one knew how the specific people, uh, no one knew the specific people behind the programming. So that became our goal, to find exactly who is engaged in the manual programming of the missile routes in the absence of automation. Well, then we discovered that the same problems existed in Syria, and that most likely it is the same team that is now engaged in programming in Ukraine. And so we began coming up with an algorithm according to which we can locate these people. Meaning you had no tips whatsoever? You simply started looking for phone bills that seemed to align with some algorithm? No, that's not how it works. Whose phone bills should we purchase in the black market? We had to have some hypothesis in terms of what kind of people could be doing it. So we used many different ways to I try to ID the initial set of people whom to investigate. It took us about a month to come up with the, with the algorithm. One of our ideas was to ask a few former guided missile experts in Russia. We asked this, if the missiles are set up manually, then where would someone learn how to do it? Can regular IT specialists, software developers, or hackers do it? Or does it require specialized training that is provided to a limited number of people? Because the best algorithm to investigate is when you find a bottleneck, a place in which the people you are investigating must appear. 
And so it was explained to us that there were only two such educational institutions in Russia that can generally create such specialists in both the computer programming and the missile disciplines. One of such institutions is called something like the Academy of Strategic Missiles in Moscow. I do not remember exactly. It specializes in missile-related programming. And the second place is the engineering department of the Marine Engineering University. I also do not remember the name exactly. It's located in the city of Pushkin, near St. Petersburg. And so we began to look for people who in their biographies, autobiographies, wrote that they graduated from these institutions. Luckily, there is a number of online artificial intelligence bots that allow you to search for specific terms like high Mars or larynx, etc. And so we started looking for people who graduated from this academy near St. Petersburg. And notice that a few of the graduates, not many, maybe 10, 15%, are also listed in a few AI bots that aggregate information from people's phone contact data. Note, this private information could be purchased on the black market in Russia. For example, this contact was saved by someone in their phone as Matthew IT MCC. This is how we came across this term MCC for the first time. We did not know what it meant and so started researching. We found very few public references to this MCC or the main computer center of the Russian armed forces. There were maybe three to four mentions online about this center. This looked like a serious and interesting organization, so we decided to find out what do they do. Officially, it's said that the center focuses on the army automation and statistics, but they did not explain why they have missile experts on their staff. So then we came up with an idea to look at the phone bills of the person with the highest position in this MCC, General Baranov, to study his circle of contacts. And we discovered that he receives phone calls at precisely the key moments, either right after the biggest successes or failures, or immediately before. When I say success and failure, this is in relation to mass strikes in Ukraine. Or also, there were a couple of cases when missiles exploded right in the Russian territory. Seems not far from the city. What's its name? In the south of Russia. I forgot. Belgorod? No, not far from Stavropol. A Russian missile exploded near the Russian city of Stavropol before reaching the Ukrainian border. And so we located a surge in calls to this general from just one phone number. We traced the number. It belonged to one Colonel Bagyuk. First time we came across this name as well. He also graduated from this academy, also a software expert. And then when we looked at his phone bills, everything became more or less clear because he communicated with about 20 out of the 30 people we discovered. His communication peak times with these people followed a few patterns. When there were strikes by the caliber, a type of Russian missiles, then he communicated with a certain group of these young people. When there were Iskander 500 missile strikes, then there was a different group of contacts. Well, then we bought phone bills of the contacts with whom the colonel communicated most often and constructed the org structure. 
because having already dealt um, with phone bill analysis for five, six years, it is quite easy for us to understand who reports to whom. Because if a person calls someone at one o'clock in the morning, that means the one who calls is the boss. And when it's February 23rd, the start of the war, everyone would be calling the boss. When it's the boss's birthday, everyone will try to be the first to call him as well. Using these analytical principles, we were able to outline their org structure and even divide it into sub-teams. Not only we knew that all these 30 people were engaged in cruise missiles, but we could also say with a large degree of probability that 10 of them are engaged with the caliber missiles, another 10 ma manage the HA-101 missiles, the ones you shoot from the plane, and about eight of them focus on the Iskander missiles. So that's the story in a nutshell. But as I shared with you during all uh, these six months of the investigation, it was a very difficult process. Now and again, I didn't have time to focus on anything but this investigation. My question is, what has shocked you the most in this investigation? It seems you have discovered them in the same manner as how professional killers get discovered. What shocked me the most? Well, because it was a such, such a drawn-out inquiry, you begin to learn more about the subjects of your investigation than about your own spouse. That's for sure applies to this case. We found out who has what mistress or lover, who frequents dating apps during working hours. What shocked me the most was the human aspect of the situation. Here are these young people, very well educated. About half of them right after receiving their specialized education went to work for the Ministry of Defense. Another half went to work for civilian firms. Some even started their own business in IT support, banking, etc. They became ordinary, urbanized young people. Without any political ideology over the last few years, they followed Western music, traveled around the world, one of them became practically a blogger who reviewed Hollywood movies, which he adored. No one would suspect that these people could suddenly start killing a thousand civilians for an idea. Yes, this was for me the strangest thing. How do they perceive this situation? The most innocent explanation here for me is that they have completely disassociated themselves from the impact of their work. They look at it like a computer game, as if they are sitting there with virtual reality goggles simulating flights. They approach the missile flights like a game and afterwards do not reflect on what happens. This is why our first conversation with one of them, Matthew, was emotional. When we first approached him, our question was, how can you do the job during the day and then watch on TV in the evening how many people you killed? I quoted his answer in our report where he said that such questions are very unprofessional, ask me something more specific and perhaps I will answer. Well, I reformulated the question and asked him more explicitly. We see a lot of civilian casualties as a result of your high precision strikes, to which could be several potential explanations. Please name for us which one is correct. 
either your missiles are not high precision and are junk, or you're not doing your job well, or you are indeed expected to hit civilian targets. Which explanation is correct? Tell us. He gave it some thought, started to write his answer a few times. It was in the Telegram chat, a Russian social media platform. And then he said, um, you understand that I cannot answer this question. And I said, okay, if you can't, you can't. Then I saw that he took a screenshot of this conversation. And later we observed that from his phone bill that he immediately reported this to his higher ups. And after that, all of our next calls and communications with the others from the group were already staged. They started giving canned answers that were absurd lies. That one of them was just a driver, another a farmer, and so on. Hence, this is my long-winded answer, but this disassociation from the consequences of their work was the most shocking aspect for me in the story, as well as our inability to bring them back to reality with our questions. And how would you answer the question you posed? Were the missiles bad? Were the programmers inadequate? Or was the objective to hurt the civilians? Because this is not in your investigation report. Correct. We do not have the right to hypothesize in our investigative reports based on our own strict new rules. But I have the right to do it in your program. Firstly, based on the technical characteristics, these missiles should not deviate by more than 5 to 7 meters from the target, which does make them the high-precision missiles. And because the way they're designed to work is not simply to travel along the, their pre-programmed route, but also during the live flight, they should be able to compare the photos uploaded to its memory of the pre-programmed route with the actual objects the missile is flying over. Including the photo of the actual target. So these missiles should, should not explode if they cannot match the actual target with its photograph. On the other hand, when we read expert opinions, even of the pro-Kremlin Russian experts, we saw that during the pre-production test of the missiles, the actual deviation from the target could reach as much as 30 to 50 meters and not 3 to 5. So you see already, this means that the missiles are not as high precision as they are promoted to be. Next, we observe that these young people, and some are not so young, engage during working hours in non-work-related activities. They are trading coins online, trying to make extra money, all during working hours. Colonel Bagyuk even organized personal deliveries to his workplace during working hours of what he bought online, including lots of toys. Others were constantly on dating sites, and not only on the dating sites. There was even a story with prostitutes that was not included in your report. Absolutely, during the working hours, at least one of them was haggling with prostitutes. There was even a funny and tragic moment when he asked the prostitute what she was doing, and she replied that she is working with a smiley face emoji, and you? And he said, I'm also working. And this happened literally a couple of hours before the major attack on Kyiv on October 16th. So this also cannot be considered as high quality work. Mm -hmm. 
And third, if until now no one has held them accountable for the civilian casualties, this means that it's either demanded by the Kremlin or at least is tolerated. So this could be considered a war crime, since there is no corrective action after we saw significant civilian casualties caused by the first few strikes. I was struck by the fact that one of them seemed to sympathize with Navalny, the Russian opposition leader. He registered for something. Well, that's why I say that this was a complete shock to me, to see a young man, an utter urban liberal, who registered for smart voting. And to look at him, he does not differ in any way from some 25-year-old Scandinavian. But he goes to work to kill people. What more can I say? That's it.